Hello, I'm Jonathan Lawrence here at Canisius College today with Jordan Schrammick. And Jordan, I heard the Rose Ensemble perform a few years ago, and so I'm so excited to have you here with the ensemble for a performance here at Canisius. Can you tell us a little bit about how the ensemble got started and particularly how you picked music from medieval Spain as the focus of this program? Sure. Thank you for having us. Uh, the Rose Ensemble is now in its 23rd performance season. We're based in Minneapolis, St. Paul, in Minnesota. And as you might imagine, after 23 years, you can start spreading your wings, so to speak, pushing the envelope uh, in terms of programmatic mm -hmm. uh, prowess and research. And because of the nature of our ensemble, which is all about researching from a number of different perspectives, language, music, mm -hmm. um, cultures, religion, of course, um, putting together concert programs is, is something that uh, I, I like to think of as an art form in and of itself, as important, if not more, than the actual performance. Based on the time uh, and place around uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, the so-called Catholic kings. Uh, and it was through that process when we realized that there was so much music to be explored from that time, whether it was dedicatory to uh, Isabel's patroness, the Virgin Mary, or uh, any number of songs at the court, it struck me that the music of the Sephardic Jews, uh, who were prevalent uh, in their kingdom, would be perfectly um, I would say reasonable to feature on the program, mm -hmm. but that really set off a conversation that we had about including music that comes from oral tradition, mm -hmm. oral sources, music that isn't necessarily written down in score form, and also to be able to tell stories such as the horrific one of the expulsion of the mm -hmm. Jews and later the Muslims from Spain in order to unite the kingdom in a singular, singular Catholic faith. And so this program has evolved over many years and um, we're now working with a Palestinian artist and also a woman who is an expert in Sephardic Jewish music. And so it has been um, a, a really wonderful co collective um, organic experience through the course of um, conversations mm -hmm. and research. I I'd spent a lot of time in Jerusalem myself putting together this program. So. We feature music from the Balkans and from uh, the mid, uh, larger Middle East, uh, North Africa, the mm -hmm. Levant, uh, Salonika, and the list goes on. And that's where all the languages come in, the vocal styles, the instrumental styles, the rhythmic modes, the musical scales. Excellent. Thank you. So you don't need to talk about every single piece you're, you're, you'll be performing, but can you talk a little bit about so, so sort of those, those cultural or musical influences and how mm -hmm. perhaps they, they, they flowed between the communities and, and not so much just each was their own, their own kind of thing. Right. It, that's a huge, uh, it's a huge question, but it's a very important <clears throat> question because I think that when we look at, for example, a tradition, if I may, like Gregorian chant mm -hmm. or plain chant in the Roman Catholic Church, one might from the outside looking in say, well, Gregorian chant is Gregorian chant. This is how it's sung. This is how the Latin is pronounced. But when you look closer, you end up having this kind of dialectual effect that happens. Maybe the Latin is pronounced slightly differently. Maybe the chant is rhythmicized or not. Uh, maybe there are ornaments or rather than just note for note. And the same applies, but to a much larger degree in the world of, say, Hebrew cantillation, mm -hmm. whether it is a religious or a specifically a liturgical text or a paraliturgical text. And then, of course, in the Arabic Islamic world, that whole uh, that world is just it's, it is inherently improvisational. So the idea then of when we look at, say, um, people who are singing a particular style in North, North Africa, mm -hmm. say Morocco, from a Sufi tradition, there might be a text that is beloved throughout the Muslim world, but the Moroccan rhythms might take, uh, a, they, it might affect 
mm -hmm. um, the performance and that so that outer realm of you call it what you want the folk tradition kind of is absorbed into the music and its performance and and if I may with with regard to the Sephardic Jews uh, this is I think the greatest example because we're talking about a people who were spread out so far and under great duress mm -hmm. and I think it is when people are oppressed that's when that preservation mm -hmm. mechanism comes in with the human mind to to remember but then to also be influenced and to and so a line of poetry might slightly take a turn maybe there is a particular uh, musical style even if an, it's about playing an instrument in mm -hmm. a certain way that is integrated into the performance <laughs> In addition to just learning the music, what has it been like to, to travel together and to perform these together mm. with the diversity within your own group? Sure. You know, the program <clears throat> itself, as I mentioned, just kind of originated several years ago as in, in, in medieval Renaissance Spain. But I wanted to expand it, and I, I had uh, expanded it in, in one particular way when I wanted to explore the idea of shared texts. You know, when we look at the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible, the Old Testament, mm -hmm. uh, that's an obvious shared text, the Psalms, etc. But it's when we dig in further to realize that the angel Gabriel appears in the Quran, uh, and Jesus is a, re a, a revered uh, prophet, uh, a messenger in, in Islam. I think that's where the story becomes interesting. So that when we bring in members of the community in a very real human way, we're able to begin having conversations. Zafar Tawil, our Palestinian artist, was born in Bethlehem, mm -hmm. and he grew up in Jerusalem. And I think that in and of itself, and because he's a musician and a scholar, um, the kinds of stories that he's able to bring from his own childhood, and also, you know, living and growing up in a 3,000-year-old city, you end up absorbing quite a bit of knowledge. And so, <coughs> It may happen in a van mm -hmm. on, on the way to a different performance, but um, that's when I, I, I'm excited about the process because it becomes so organic. Mm -hmm. And then because it is so improvisational, improvisatory, the performance is affected on a daily basis. The more that we converse, and it, it's, it could be something as simple as fasting. You know, fasting is a common theme and a common idiom in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, but it's treated differently. And also, on, on the sort of on the other side of it, what have been the reaction of audiences sometimes hearing melodies or styles that parallel things that they're familiar with, but they never knew that the other groups had the same kind of traditions. Right. You know, it's interesting because I, I, there, one of the things that has struck me most, I think most um, surprisingly, is that a lot of people don't know that Hebrew and Arabic are, are cousin languages. Mm -hmm. And I think that that alone can, um, in such a simple but bold way, if I can say it that way, really enlightens people. And, um, you know, we're singing in so many different languages, but the language of the Sephardic Jews is Ladino. It's a mixture of Hebrew and Spanish. That alone tells a, a bit of a story. Um, and I, I just, I, audiences have been, I think, struck and maybe it's purposeful in the way that we have programmed the concert. It begins with calls to prayer, another kind of universal aspect mm -hmm. of the Abrahamic faiths. Um, and you know, the Hebrew, the Jewish tradition has many different ways to call the community to prayer. Christians, I, we, I think more church bells than anything, so we've chosen mm -hmm. a Gregorian chant that's quite evocative. But then there's the adhan, the, the call to prayer in Islam, which is so widely known, I think, you know, unfortunately in somewhat of a negative connotation especially in the political and the mm -hmm. media realm and i think when people hear those things up front close they are immediately struck with something quite profound that perhaps they've never heard live before excellent thank you now 
talking about the the material in the program, I do notice that there are two songs that, at least by title, seem to be the same. You know, the, the songs about Nimrod. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, why both, why two versions of the same song or, or the backgrounds yes. of them? We we begin and end <clears throat> our program with the story of the birth of Abraham. Abraham is in Islam imam to the nations. Mm -hmm. In um, Judaism, he's merciful and blessed father. You tell me in Christianity, I've always, uh, he's Father Abraham, right? And exactly. he had seven sons, sir. <laughs> That's right. Um, but it is so, I think it's so important because the, the uh, Ladino tradition tells two different stories. And I think that's, that's typical of oral tradition. They kind of change mm -hmm. and shift about the prophecy of a child being born under a shining star. And I think oh people are, it's, it's evocative of the Christian story, mm -hmm. but it is the birth of that common denominator. And I think that's a perfect way to begin and end. Uh, it's a sign of hope, and it is more about what is similar than dissimilar. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank, you, thank you for sharing about the program, and thank you so much for bringing the ensemble to perform here. And now back to our host.